um, and that we will have um, an opportunity for questions and discussion at the end of the webinar. Um, and I'd like to start us off by introducing our presenters. Um, I believe we'll be starting with uh, Wade Gallen. We'll get us started. Um, Nope. Oh, thanks. Th th thanks, Hillary. This is Opal Greenway. I'm a principal at Stroud Water Associates and appreciate everybody joining us today. With me are my colleagues, Amy Graham and Wade Gallen, and to present to you guys about what's going on with surprise billing, the new changes to the physician fee schedule. But we're doing it from a little bit of a different lens than some of you who have might have been paying attention to things that are typically considered revenue cycle issues. The way we're approaching our presentation today is to actually really talk to you guys about how these issues might impact your overall provider strategy. While these are typically seen as revenue cycle issues and things that finance seems to be paying the most attention to, as we have seen that with the COVID, with what's happened with COVID and what's happening with provider recruitment and retention, you know, anything that we do is impacting our overall provider strategy, it's impacting, we have to take into consideration our staffing shortages, and we're really operating in a new world here. And so when we take those different things that are going on into consideration, we need to take every opportunity that we have, including ones that are traditionally seen as really finance opportunities, and thinking about them from a, uh, from a perspective of how does it impact my other areas. And today, focusing on that from how, does it, how can we leverage this to create opportunities to increase our provider alignment, both with physicians and non-physician providers. So that being said, we definitely want to spend today talking about what is the No Surprises Act, what's going on with surprise billing, making sure everybody understands technically what are they required to do, what are the rules, what are the changes to the physician fee schedule, so that we can understand what is our technical grounding with what we're working from. And then let's we will dig into how does that impact our provider issues? What are the things that are going to be important to this for physicians and non-physician providers? And how can you utilize that? What are some strategies that we see that work with engaging your providers on these specific issues? And then we'll finish up today talking about actually how can you also think about that from the end user, the patient in mind, and using those opportunities. So that being said, I'm going to hand it off over to Amy Graham, who is going to talk to us a little bit about the technical aspects of the No Surprises Act and surprise billing. Thanks, Opal. I appreciate it. The first thing I wanted to start off with is just to explain to everyone what the what surprise billing is, because you may have heard about it, but really don't haven't heard the definition. And so the Federal Register actually defines surprise billing as being a medical bill that is an unexpected bill from a healthcare provider or facility that occurs when a covered person receives medical services from a provider or facility that usually unknown to the participant or beneficiary or enrollee is a non-participating provider or facility with respect to the individual's coverage. And that's where the surprise comes, is that it's a surprise. They didn't know they were receiving this bill, unfortunately. And so the Department of Health and Human Services, um, this Secretary Becerra, on the next page, if you want to go to that one, Wade, they, he, Secretary Becerra actually, sh actually said, that health insurance should offer patients peace of mind and that they won't be saddled with the unexpected cost. And the Biden-Harris administration remains committed to ensuring that transparency and affordable care with this rule and affordable care. And with this rule, the surprise billing rule that's come out, Americans will get the assurance that they will not receive any surprises and that no patient should forego care for the fear of receiving a bill. Now, currently in the United States, there are actually several states that have put surprise billing laws on their individual state books. And so we've provided this map. The Commonwealth Fund actually put this together and pulled out and show, is reflecting that 18 states that are in the darker color do have comprehensive plans in place already. And so when talking of those talking to people in those states, they're familiar with the concepts, they understand what's there. And in some instances, their state law will supersede the federal law that's out there. 
In 15 states, there are partial protections on the books. So there may be some rules on the books related to a specific line of business or a specific area of concern. And that's in those limited states in the lighter color. And then the states that don't have any color in them, they have no protection at all. So it's 18 states, including uh, the District of Columbia, don't have any protection on their books. Whereas the other states do have some form of surprise billing protection and law out there. So that just helps us understand the playing field as to where this law comes in and what that looks like and what the impact is for those states. But then what we really want to do, though, is to tell you about the act itself. And so in looking at that, I'm going to hand it over to Wade. And Wade's going to tell you about the different legislations that have come out in the past 12 months, I would say, regarding the No Surprises Act. Perfect. Thank you, Amy. It's a pleasure to be with you all on this call and to discuss this important topic. So we're going to dive right into the No Surprises Act and get a sense of what is going on there. Uh, I would just note um, surprise billing has uh, been around for quite a while, and it isn't an issue that just sprang up with this act. It's been ongoing, and as we saw in the previous slide, states have made some legislative efforts to address surprise billing, some more so than others, but with no guaranteed baseline to protect patients from surprise billing uh, from a legislative perspective, Congress moved to pass this legislation to basically act as that baseline. And the, this was passed on December 27th of 2020. This was part of the Consolidated Appropriations Act. And this was, again, really a push to protect the patient from situations in which they might receive a surprise bill. Uh, as you read through all of the regulations, you'll notice that it is very patient focused and a lot of the uh, confusion, a lot of the contention largely lies on how, how um, this impacts the provider, uh, the hospital, as well as the insurer in this situation. But this is just a, a quick list of some of the items that came through through the No Surprises Act. Again, a huge focus on the patient and making sure that in most situations in which they would receive a surprise bill, that 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 they do not receive that surprise bill. They made it very clear that they can't prevent every single uh, time a patient receives a surprise bill, but they can significantly reduce the number of times it, it comes up. And so with that, following this legislation being passed by Congress and then signed into law, uh, it's been a busy 2021 as CMS and other regulatory bodies have released a slew of, of guidance related to the law. And these have all had a bit of a different skew. So the July 13th regulation that came out was really kind of the meat and potatoes of what was going on there. And, and some of the following legislation was clarifying different aspects of the surprise billing protections. Um, so for instance, October 7th, the regulation that came out during that time, so requirements related to surprise billing part two, that was heavily focused on the independent dispute resolution process, which we'll dive into a little bit later. But they cover everything from this, this IDR process to just naming the situations in which a patient would likely receive a surprise bill. And just a, a note that there have been other um, items that have been issued. They just haven't come out through regulations. So there have been a number of forms CMS has issued. Uh, a good example of this would be the notice and consent um, form, which was a document that was uh, provided to help with um, to help providers and, and physicians really understand uh, how they might approach implementing some of the aspects of the regulations. So there are quite a, a few resources out there. And with that, we're going to look at some of these situations in which we're going to encounter surprise billing and the financial impact associated with that. I'll turn it back over to Amy. So thanks, Wade. In looking at it with the situations in where we encounter surprise billing. So surprise billing happens in a lot of emergency and non-emergent care settings. And so you so for example, 
a patient is at the hospital, but they require emergency transport, either on the road or through the air from a non-participating provider to a participating facility. So the hospital could be covered, but the emergency medical transport is not participating with the plan. And so they, so the patient would receive a bill and that's where you could see a surprise bill because they are not participating in the plan. Another example would be that a patient would be receiving emergency care at a non-participating provider or facility. And then the third example that we have here as to when a patient would encounter a surprise bill would be if they are going to they are if they are at a facility to a hospital and then they receive ancillary services at that hospital but those providers are not participating in the specific plan. Examples of this would be like a radiology group that the professional services are under a separate group. That group is not participating in the insurance plan for the hospital or that the hospital accepts. And then that would be where it would where the patient would receive that out of network bill. Or it could happen in the laboratory or again in the anesthesia with the anesthesiologist, typically from those professional services. And so what we wanted to do is just actually share with you the financial impact because you know, at the end of the day, what, you know, how is it going to impact the bottom line? What is it going to look like? And what we can see is that with this surprise billing legislation, this payment is shifting from being the responsibility of the patient, where the patient would receive the copay and deductible and out of network costs on a bill, that they're now shifting that to being the responsibility of the provider or the insurance company. And the financial impact is going to be, how much will the insurance company pay the provider? Is the insurance company going to pay them the total amount that was billed and all of the associated out-of-network costs or, or out-of-network fees? Or is there going to be a negotiated rate? So that, you know, you need to keep that into consideration as to what that will be. There's also, as Wade had mentioned, going to be a dispute resolution process. And if you do decide to go into that dispute resolution process, what's the fee going to be for doing it? Is the cost for the dispute resolution more than the actual charge that the patient would be billed for? Is it going to be less than? Those are still things that we're waiting for the final legislation to come out and actually share so that we can see it. There are contractual allowance and bad debt implications as well, because instead of the patient receiving that bill, it's now becoming the insurance company's responsibility. And with that insurance com responsibility, does that then you know, become a negotiated amount to where it falls into contractual allowance above the net revenue line, or is in a bad debt expense where it's below the net revenue line? And then there's also the cost of compliance and the fines for the lack of compliance. What is going to happen in these? Theoretically, what we would see is that um, there could be staff education that you need to make sure that you are educating your staff on and letting them know what the compliance needs to be and how to work through that. So you want to make sure that these fees don't add up, you know, that they're not adding up and that you're not encountering fines for lack of compliance, but that you are actually, you know, just aware that that's out there. Now, going on to the next topic, where it's actually shifting the burden of responsibility. So with surprise billing legislation, the out-of-network burden now shifts from being a payer, patient responsibility to a payer negotiated rate. And what does that mean? Well, expected payment amounts are going to decrease because the, the amount that, um, that the insurance company is going to pay will most likely not be the entire balance on the claim. So you can expect that the payments will decrease. However, the overall collection expense will also decrease because studies have shown that to collect from a patient costs four times more than to collect from an insurance company. So the, there's a cost, there will be a reduction in your overall cost to, that you should see on your financials related to the shifting of the burden of responsibility. 
one of the areas we wanted to do is actually show you an example of a, what the impact of the patient would be. So you can see in this example, we have an EOB that the patient has received. The EOB is showing that there were four actual charges that went through on this bill. And with this, you can see that there were total charges of $893. And on two of those lines, there are network savings of zero, reflecting that these are out of network claims. And then you have two network savings of $62.27 on one line and $63.46 on the other. So this is showing that on the first two lines, it was an out of network claim. The second two lines, it was an, an in-network claim. And so then paid to the provider, you can see on that section that, you know, nothing happened on the paid to the provider because of um, what the impact was to the patient. And so we, when looking at that, the entire balance of 90, the entire balance of $893.76 is um, owed to the provider by the patient. So the hospital will need, or the provider will need to go to the patient to receive those funds and collect on them. In the instances in, when they, in which they are in network services, the amount that the, pay, that the provider or the hospital would go after is not the entire balance of the $94.50, but rather a balance of $31.04, because the network savings of $63 have been deducted from the overall amount that would be paid. And in this instance, what we are seeing is that the burden of responsibility is shifting that the patient will no longer be responsible for paying that non-covered charge of $796 in, as reflected in that first line, but rather that's going to be shifted to a negotiated amount with the patient or with the insurance company. And so it will be more closely resembling the um, lines, that the last two lines than the first two lines, but you should also be able to collect on that, as we had shared before, collect on that in a um, cheaper manner of sorts in that it will be less expensive to um, have a discussion with an insurance company and receive that than the cost associated with uh, billing and chasing after the patient for that out of network balance. So you will see that amount shifting. Now, in looking at this, what we want to do now is talk about what we can do to um, see, I'm sorry, talk about the CMS physician fee schedules and the changes that are going to come through in 2022. And Opal, I'm going to hand this over to you to talk about this section. Thanks, Amy. So as I mentioned, right, our conversation today is about things that are typically handled by the finance department. And with that, I can't, um, but how it impacts your overall for provider strategy. And we can't talk about what's going on from a financial perspective and its impact on provider strategy without also discussing the physician fee schedule. Um, last year was a huge shakeup in, um, in 2020, where there was a significant change in the provider fee schedule, and we saw all of our changes in work RVUs, right? However, I think a lot of people were hoping, okay, we got through COVID, and if we can just get through the next year, you know, we'll be able to deal with it in 2022. And surely for the 2022 year, you know, there's going to be enough lobbying that's going to go on that we're going to see a change in the physician fee schedule. And it won't be the drastic change. So if we can kick the can down the road and we'll stick to paying our providers for whom we have a per work RVU rate type compensation factor um, in how we pay them, we'll be able to kick that can down the road and just tie it to the 2020 fee schedule until everything sorts out. Well, lo and behold, what has happened? We on November 2nd, we were able to get out the 2022 final rule with regards to the physician fee schedule. And guess what? So work RVUs have changed have not changed. They are sticking with the drastic changes that happened in the work RVU. On top of that, the fact that we previously had a um, an increase to try to keep, you know, we had a lot of lobbying. And we had a temporary 3.75% increase last year to try to keep things from having such a huge impact. No, we're having this year, the conversion factor is decreasing down to $33.59. That's a 7% decrease 
But then when you take into consideration the fact that they've restored the 2% Medicare payment sequester, and they've, had, they've actually also restored the 4% statutory pay for cut, the actual reduction for physicians and their payments on the physician fee schedule is 9.75%. Now, we'll see. I was having a conversation with a hospital C, uh, uh, COO this morning, and we were discussing, you know, let's see what happens with the lobbying, whether or not this year we can get, you know, Congress can do some stuff between now and the end of the year that will make this 9.75% cut more palatable. Will we get an expansion of that temporary 3.75% increase that we had last year so that it doesn't hurt so bad? Um, on top of that, there's some, been in some additional changes that you know your billers and coders will pay attention to and make sure that they need to educate the physicians on is with regards to the splitting of the ENM billing for the same group practice. And this is where they actually really spent time defining what it is to be a substantive portion of the visit and being established for how you actually do your split ENM billing for that same group practice. And in this case, they're going to give credit to the provider who spends more than half of the total time for the visit. However, you can also say you are doing the substantive portion of a visit if you are the provider who does the bulk of the history, the physical exam, or the medical decision making. But the key is just you're going to have to do additional documentation to establish who is the primary provider on your split ENM billing. So those of you who do a lot of your visits utilizing both providers and non-physician providers to do your able to be able to do your split billing, you need to make sure that you're on top of how that documentation works and making sure your providers are educated on that and also the billers and the coders that they know how are they actually making sure that they're putting in the appropriate modifiers for establishing that substantive portion of the, of the visit for your payment changes. On top of that, with there we have the clinical labor rate uh, cut that initially people were thinking that cut was only gonna last until 2022. It has been extended all the way until 2025. And where that really matters, of course, is for any of our specialties that have significant payments for supplies and equipment. So you think about it, oncology, vascular, radiology, um, interventional cardiology, e any of these that have significantly high equipment or supply costs, the fact that the, la the clinical labor rates are going to be cut um, and going forward, that those of you who have been really relying on your payments coming from to be able to cover those supplies and equipment, those are going to be impacted as well. And so you're going to see your revenue be potentially be going down in those specialties. And then the last thing that's key takeaway from the CMS physician fee schedule has been the fact that the telehealth services payments are going to continue through the end of 2023. So that has been extended. And the important thing with that, and we'll talk about your telehealth strategy with providers, is the fact that they've also said that the in-person visit requirement to be able to bill for a telehealth service, that you previously had to at least have an in-person visit within six months of that telehealth visit. Now it's just that has to be at least once per year. I think that overall CMS is embracing the utilization of telehealth or recognizing with the provider shortages that we have, that we have to be able to leverage technology to deal with the provider shortage. And so making it a little bit more lenient to make sure you're still getting payments for those telehealth services. There's also been an expansion in the telehealth services recognizing the, the significant behavioral health um, uh, shortages that we have, that mental health is now allowed for telehealth for audio only visits, including actually substance abuse disorder treatments and, and expanding that. So this is broadly, when we think about the physician fee schedule, the changes to the work RVU rates that we were thinking about previously are still in place so that you can't just rely on the 2020 schedule anymore with a straight face. We have to be thinking about it from a strategic perspective of how are this change in the total work RVUs that our primary care have significant positive impacts on their work RVUs and urgent care, family medicine, internal medicine. Those, their work RVUs are all going to be going up substantially for billing the same CPT codes and making sure we understand that, that kind of impact. So I know that a lot of people on this call, your finance departments have been dealing with the surprise billing, you're dealing with the physician fee schedule and trying to say, okay, what is gonna be my revenue impact of those pieces? Well, let's go ahead and shift gears a little bit while it's important to know those revenue impacts. 
let's think about it from that provider strategy perspective and talk about some of these top provider issues and, and how you're dealing with it. So we look at this and we say, okay, what are things, you know, there's a lot of key issues that happen with all, all the things that we've been talking about support so far with regards to the surprise billing. But we really need to think about it from what are, you know, in addition to this, the, the mandates and provisions that are going to be in formal rulemaking, what are the things that are going to actually come across to your physicians and non-physician providers that are actually going to come across their plate that they have to deal with? Where is it going to be? And oftentimes, this is going to be situations where you might have um, a PSA um, arrangement with a provider group. Amy was talking about very commonly you contract with an emergency medicine group that is out of that might be out of network for people in your emergency department or you're using the anesthesiologist where the general surgeon um, you know is in network but the anesthesiologist is out of network how does that it contact um, impact the provider's engagement is who is the patient going to call to complain about when they get the surprise bill oftentimes they're going to call the number on it's going to be on the um, on the bill and it might be directly with that independent provider or that out of network provider that you have a relationship with. And so making sure that these providers are prepared for these issues and having an alignment strategy with them on how to deal with it, whether it's the balance bill, the independent dispute resolution, and what your communication strategy is the first area where you actually have an opportunity to engage with the providers around these situations. And so the top ones that we think, while there's several different mandates and provisions that might impact you as an organization, the ones that impact the providers the most really are what we're seeing as this balance billing restriction. So where that, um, where that shift and who's going to be responsible for the payments are is going to be the actual labor intensive ind independent dispute resolution. It's going to be the communication plan between the hospital and the facility and actually the patients themselves and being on the same page of that communication. It's going to be that CMS physician fee schedule of finally having to deal with some of the compensation changes. And then also finally, how are you going to utilize telehealth where some people thought they only had to deal with it when people couldn't come to the office because of COVID. And now we realize actually we need to leverage technology significantly more. And luckily we're going to get paid for it. So how can we take that advantage of that? So let's dive into it um, a little bit deeper with Wade talking about some of our balance billing restrictions. Um, and, and how exactly the mechanics of that's going to work and why providers are going to care. Perfect. Thanks, Opal. So we're hoping that this can be a, just a, an open conversation on these slides. And we're going to, as Opal mentioned, kind of define some of these uh, significant provider issues and then talk about how they might impact provider strategy. And so, uh, yeah, Opal and Amy, feel free to to jump in as well and, and discuss your thoughts. But the first item we noted was the balance billing restrictions as brought up in the No Surprises Act and subsequent regulations. And wh why this is impactful is because you know, providers will not be able to bill for certain services. So a great example is out-of-network emergency services. Um, another example in which many people do often receive uh, surprise bills, balance bills, which are often used interchangeably, relates to ancillary provider providers in a facility that is in network. So you have a, a provider that's providing an ancillary service in an in-network facility, but they themselves are not within that network. And so that would often result in a surprise bill. That's not going to be, uh, that's not going to work going forward, um, starting when the uh, regulations take effect, which is January 1st of 2022. Um, so that's going to be something that will be pretty impactful from a provider perspective, not being able to bill that. And just to give some further context, they have started to put teeth to some of these restrictions as well. Um, physician or providers, facilities, they can receive up to $10,000 worth of uh, penalties per violation if they violate some of this. So if a patient does wind up getting a surprise bill, there is that potential financial risk there as well as likely a uh, bad PR. Um, so there are some exceptions to these rules, but generally speaking, you can't bill for out-of-network emergency services, and that sometimes includes post-stabilization services. Again, those anc ancillary services provided by an out-of-network provider at an in-network facility, and then out-of-network air ambulance services as well. So I don't know if Opal and Amy had any comments around provider strategy 
related to this, but I'll. Yeah. So, I mean, you have on your way the exception, right? Like, like when I think about it, so the warrior in me kicks in of being like, all right, what do I legally have to do to make sure I'm in compliance with my restrictions? What is it? What is the base minimum I need to do, right? To, you know, you have this situation where technically in the rule that the patient can waive this balance billing restriction, right? They have to get it in writing and they have to get what's considered adequate amount of time to be able to consider the financial implications and that they that they can for you know say no, I don't want to work with this non-participating provider. So let's translate that into reality because there's the legal thing, right? You go into the you go into the emergency room and you're you know you're concerned about getting treated for whether or not I mean, hopefully it's not, you know, if it's not a heart attack where somebody's talking to either you, the patient directly, or they're talking to somebody who's responsible for filling out those forms for you. And we've, and many of us have been there. So you get the piece of paper that's in front of you and it says, okay, here's my privacy thing that I have to sign. Here's the insurance paperwork that I'm filling out. Oh, here's financial responsibility. And realistically, the lawyer in me will say, okay, put a paragraph where the, for the patient to initial, where they waive you know, out of network status and that they say on the financial responsibility form that they fill out, let me just have the patient, you know, sign, we just put in our standard contract that they can waive it. And if they don't sign that one, then it's not waived and we can't send them the balance billing and we'll just teach our billing department to make sure. But that's one strategy to go about doing that. The reality is though, that doesn't get at the heart of what the bill is. And I, I when I'm thinking forward, I really think that that's something that's going to be cracked down on them that are going to give a lot more teeth to what does it mean about what is the amount of notice time that a patient receives to make this decision? Can you actually put it in, you know, a financial responsibility provision? And also then you you take that into, all right, the patient waives it, so you send them the balance bill. And the balance bill comes from, you know, the emergency medical group that is actually providing the care that is separate from the facility. So they get it from X hospital and then they get a bill from Y provider group. Well, the bill that they weren't expecting usually is the one from X provider group. It's not the one from the hospital. They expect the bill from the hospital. And so who do they call? They're going to call and question the billing services for that independent provider group. That's, that's who they're going to get on the phone conversation with and be what on earth is this bill for? And you say, well, well you waived it. And so, in that situation, who do you think government is going to go after? Most likely, it's going to be that emergency medicine group for sending out that bill that the patient doesn't feel like they got really truly constructive notice that they were waiving something that they didn't necessarily intend to or didn't feel like they had any power to not waive that, that balance billing. And so in working with the providers, depending on who, in the example I'm using with an emergency medical group, when you say who gets that bill, who is the patient calling, it depends on the size of your medical group. If you're working with like say MCARE, one of the largest um, emergency medical groups in the country, they probably, they have their own billing department, right? And it's, and it's so removed from who the provider that was specifically giving the services to the patient that you think about it, all the layers that the patient is having to go through and who they're getting upset with and where is the legislation going to crack down? So the, if I'm the facility, if I'm X medical center, I need to have an understanding with, okay, what is going to be on the receiving end for the patient? And also what is any backlash, if any, going to happen to that emergency medical group for that, how, how this goes down? What is, what is the relationship with their billing department? If I'm working with a smaller, group and then you know let's just say i'll switch over to anesthesiology i'm working with a local anesthesiology group that might have four or five providers they you know they whether it's their they have their own billing person or if they've handed over to the hospital or whether or not they have um, a third party that's dealing with it you know you have you're dealing with a smaller group that this might be a significant part of their pnl to have an outside billing company be doing it or if they have to ever deal with it directly. I think that's more likely to happen with a pathology group than it is anesthesiology. But then we'll use pathology as an example here for lab services. If they're having to deal with it themselves, that's something that is going to bog down providers that this is not what they spend their time doing 
is dealing with patients saying, wait a minute, I've heard in the news about surprise billing. I'm not supposed to get a bill anymore. Why did I get this bill? So if you're going to go the route of like focusing in on how the patient can waive that balance billing protection, you really need to think through these issues and kind of go down the scenarios of how is it going to be perceived by the patient? Because surprise billing is in the news. I hear it on the headlines on a regular on a regular basis, you know, when I say Alexa, good morning, you know, and it tells me what my news is for the day. I've heard about surprise billing even if I wasn't in healthcare. And so having that done in a very cohesive manner and understanding that the hospital doesn't need to just worry about covering its waiver, but how can it work with its providers and what's the reality for that, you know, physician group and and how they handle it. Do they have a third party billing that's going to get called? Do, are they going to get, be hearing from patients themselves directly? Is the hospital handing it? Making sure you're all on the same page and involving the physicians in a conversation that you might not normally is, I think, going to be really important because who is the one that gets in trouble, like, is going to be responsible for the fact that they weren't supposed to send that balance bill? It's, it's going to be the physician group. And so I think that's, that's one way, way that I see this playing out that's going to be important to to treat it differently than you might have in the past. Um, hey, and Opal, to... Opal, I wanted to pipe in there and say, and from a provider perspective, um, you know, every provider in healthcare has a group that is sending out bills. They're managing that revenue cycle piece of it. And I can say that from the revenue cycle piece of it, if I have a provider that reaches out to me and says, hey, how are we handling this surprise billing situation? How are we, you know, if we want to bill these patients, what can I do to participate in it? That really makes me excited, gets me excited because I know that I've got an engaged provider who's going to help us think through all of the scenarios, and I'm more than happy to share the scenarios with them and, and what our thoughts are and brainstorm on ideas. And so I would, you know, just say there are, you know, the hospital has a revenue cycle team. And just to, you know, talk to the administration and say, who's your revenue cycle contact, they can get you a name who can be engaged in those discussions and help you think through those scenarios as well. Yeah, Amy, I think that's a really great point because the reality is, is the physician themselves unlikely is going to have the time to be, you know, that this is not what you want your physician spending their time, you know, really focusing on. Um, they're ones that might, you know, think, thinking strategically and who are into the financial aspects who are going to be doing that. But the physician, it goes a long way that, that they'll appreciate that the two revenue cycle teams are coordinating with one another. Right. I mean, Just, to me, that that's the goodwill that you're creating with your providers, not trying to bog them down specifically to solve it themselves, but putting who needs to talk to one another together and working on it from both sides. And and I would say, too, a lot of times the revenue cycle people are the people who don't know those other contacts, but we're more than happy to talk to people about revenue cycle all day long. <laughs> all right. Wait, sorry about that. Didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's quite all right. That's quite all right, and I think it really speaks to how key coordination is uh, in this context as we as we think about these restrictions that are going to be uh, implemented. Um, so, moving moving on to the next provider item that we mentioned, it really has to do with the what they call the IDR process in the regulations. Um, and what I want to convey with this is just how timely. Or, or, or how time intensive and resource intensive this process can be uh, if it's played out to the fullest extent. You can look over there and you see the timeline on the right of the screen, and it shows um, some of the it shows the number of days for each step in the process. And so when you think about this again from a, um, a financial perspective, you kind of you have to wonder, you know, how much is this actually going to play out as the regulations get implemented? over the next year, are we going to be seeing a lot of these uh, dispute resolution processes last this long? And just to put a little context to this, the, the IDR was put in place to help um, provide an avenue for providers or insurers to basically disagree with payment that they had received. So if a, a provider receives a certain amount from an insurer related to a surprise billing uh, patient because they can no longer bill that patient for for the the balance between patient responsibility and and the rate. 
um, they would engage in this independent dispute resolution IDR process in order to um, try and collect some of that money. So if, if an insurance company gave a payment that the provider deemed to be insufficient or not in line with the actual services rendered, they could initiate this process. But again, when you think about some of the regular processes in, in collecting on a bill and then you add on top of it the independent dispute resolution process, this can really um, push out the time to collections for, for some of your patient balances. And um, so this will, this can have a number of different impacts and we can discuss more about provider strategy, but definitely want to communicate the time intensive nature of this process. It's also uh, costly to some degree. There is an administrative fee associated with this process as well as, um, well, Technically, two fees. One is for the IDR entity, what they deem as an IDR entity, and they're the ones who would basically be taking these disputes between a provider and an insurer and making a judgment about who is correct and, and which amount should be issued to the provider. So you have a fee going to these entities as well as an administrative fee, which are going to the federal process. So there is that cost as a portion of this as well. So th this could potentially not only um, increase the amount of time it takes to collect, but also increase the number of dollars to collect in certain instances. Um, so I don't know if there's any other. Yeah, yeah wait, I'm glad you brought the, when, when bringing this up, you know, you're talking about the time to collect and, and um, the cost to collect. Most, so I work primarily with a lot of, um, with physician groups, whether they are employed or independent. But you think about a physician entity, they don't have to, a lot of them, they don't have the resources or the time to negotiate with the insurance payers. One of the things that we hear about, frankly, is physicians saying, hey, we would like better alignment and better help from our health systems that we're affiliated with, with regards to dealing with the payers. You know, and does that, you know, what's the best way of going about doing that? Do I need to just actually come up with some sort of billing services agreement with the hospital so that it's completely off of my plate or you know how can i actually use my hospital be a good partner to me in figuring out things with the payers and the fact that this now independent dispute resolution is here um, with when it comes to the surprise billing aspect this is just an additional reason for physician groups to say hospital what are you going to do for me to help me with this because you know, especially if I'm a if I'm a small physician practice, you know, I'm a, a five doc pathology group that's working in your hospital, um, but I still have to do my own billing and like with my and I have to deal with the payer contracts myself. There's a significant you know time that takes me away from what you want me to do, where what what you have a shortage of is actual providers to be able to go through this process. I mean, you look at this; it's 103 days, and it, you know we look at days in AR, um, and for a physician group, they're shooting for 45 days. If they have to now be in a situation where they can't get money from um, because they're stuck in this independent dispute resolution situation of 103 days, there's a reason why physicians actually oftentimes are not chasing down this down the money, right, from um, on a revenue cycle, which I'm sure, Amy, you could talk about a little bit more in a second, is, you know, we do talk about what, it, how do you, track the dollar from when it was the the charge generated all the way until it's been collected and you know you've been told no by the insurance company and that's that's it you know a lot of groups don't go through and really process their denials and don't go and and don't go and chase after that money here's another thing that they wouldn't chase after if you're not going to fight your denials going through this independent dispute resolution they're like well you know i would you know, this is whatever I get from the insurance company is probably more than what I would have got from the patient to begin with. Um, and Amy was talking previously about how it's four times more expensive to collect from the patient. The reality is, though, that exp um, if the physicians have the relationship with the patient, so let the physicians have that relationship with the patient and focus on um, where can they create alignment there and where can the physicians make sure that the patient is having a really good experience and not receiving, you know, bills that they're not supposed to be receiving, et cetera. And let, you know, the hospitals who have probably a little bit more of the resources that are used to chasing down things with the insurance companies, let them, like, let each side do what they do best 
and real and collaborate that and have agreements in place as to who's going to do what and then you can coordinate between your different you know between the different parties and here's where we really you know if we think about alignment being a three-legged stool between you know contractual governance and financial i mean here's a way where you can really actually set up how are you aligned with your providers to handle who handles what best and you can do it from an, an actual contractual arrangement I mean, that's just one way way that I would I would look at this is of having really putting it on the hospital side of trying to help providers deal with this IDR situation. You know, Opal, right. the other thing the other thing that I find very interesting is that you are going to have to manage this like you manage denials because the 30 day initiate the 30 day open negotiation period starts on the day of the initial payment or notice of denial of payment. And so our, how are you managing your denials? How are you managing your payments? And to be aware of there are some payers who will issue the payment and their payment date is on um, November 10th, but that money doesn't make it into your bank account because of mail and a holiday and things like that until like November, say 17th. Well, that's six days out of that 30 day process that you potentially have lost because of the just banking delays and things like that. So to really understand how that process works because the pay, you know, the providers need to be paid for services that they've, that they've rendered and you know it it is a challenge but to work with that revenue cycle team to make sure that it is on the radar and that people are aware of just the process to go after it absolutely i think another interesting part is at the end of this whole process the provider might not even uh get the additional monies that they were going for in the first place so not only do you have this extended period of time, but you also have the uncertainty of whether or not you're gonna be receiving additional funds, um, and that'll all be determined during the IDR process. And it'll be really interesting to see how this all plays out as the, uh, the new year comes up. Um, there have been some states who uh, a bit, are a bit more progressive on the surprise billing front and have put in place a lot of regulations and had an independent dispute resolution process that they've tracked, and it's been, it's pretty interesting to look to see um, some of the figures behind that. But as we start to see this information tracked, it'll be very interesting to see the results of the IDR process, what um, what the over the the final judgments end up being, and how that stacks up to um, the initial dispute. And it'll be a fascinating uh, fascinating data set to look at. So as we move on to the next slide, we have hospital facility communication regarding provider network status. So there's a lot in the surprise billing regulations that talk about how a hospital needs to communicate upfront, um, especially with um, services that are planned in advance, communicating with the patient, you know, what's the expected charge on this, being able to provide expected charges to uh, insurers so that they can generate an advanced DOB. Uh, there's notice and consent, which has already been brought up um, which would need to happen within a specific time frame and under uh, only very uh, specific circumstances as noted in the, in the regs. And so we have this overarching theme of hospitals and facilities are going to need to learn how to, to really communicate uh, in a more, or, uh, more granular level with insurers regarding this process. And there's still some questions outstanding as to how exactly the, the transfer of data is gonna work between uh, facilities and insurers, providers and insurers, when it comes to uh, patient estimates. That's something that we're gonna be on the lookout for and hopefully see some, some comprehensive guidance on in the near future. Um, but as far as the New Year is concerned, they are falling back on what they consider a good faith effort um, in terms of how they're, they're presenting this to patients. So at the end of the day, these regs have been, as I mentioned before, very patient focused and they do not want patients to be in a situation where they can't get a good sense of what it might cost to receive care in different settings. And so the hope is that through some of these uh, legislative um, clarifications that they can help the patients in those, in those settings. This also references a CMS form number, as I referred to earlier, 
This relates to notice and consent. Basically, um, if a patient uh, gives consent to bill them for a given service, they can they can give that to the, the provider who is uh, providing care. And they put this in there to basically say that there will always be circumstances in which a patient might want to forego these. But again, as we talk more, that will impact your strategy in terms of how it's presented and the implications of that. Um, and Wade, so, Wade, the surprise billing legislation doesn't talk about pricing transparency and shoppable services that are out there, but it does tie in hand in hand with the good faith estimate of charges related to services that sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, to prevent the surprise billing, you know, the hospital um, can leverage that information that has been provided there and share that with their patients as well. So that's that's an area that not only in addition to the notice and consent documents and um, the CMS forms that you provided, but, you know, looking at this other legislation that came out in 2021 or went into effect in 2021 and just leveraging that data as well. Absolutely. It's a great point, Amy. And, and it, it's interesting, surprise billing and pricing transparency. There's, there's definitely a theme there and, and seeing how they, they, uh, play off one another is, is interesting. Um, so we'll move on to, for the sake of time, we'll go over to the next slide. And I, I yeah. believe uh, we'll yeah. you want to run. So in this, so let's just talk about the physician fee schedule. As I said, you need it, you know, if you've been kicking the can down the road with regards to your compensation changes, um, you know, I, I have to, I would have to say time's up. With regards to that, since we did not see CMS making significant, you know, they did not walk these changes back um, and definitely adopted them. You know, I, I look at it for, okay, how are you going to handle it? Well, what did you do the, in 2021? Did you keep the status quo? And you're saying, I mean, we do have clients who are saying, we're keeping the 2020 physician fee schedule, not for billing purposes, but for our work RVU calculations for our providers. And we'll wait until the surveys, quote, catch up, right? We're going to wait until the MGMA data because there's been such a mix of how people use it. We want to see really what happens to productivity, what, you know, f um, that we should be paying our physicians off of, you know, based off of what survey data is. I want to see what the real um, median is that of uh, productivity you know, that isn't being skewed by COVID. And so I want to see what the actual impact is for 2020 um, or 20 and 2021 with the physician fee schedule changes. And until we actually see that information, I have organizations who said that they are going to pay off of the 2020 schedule all the way until 2023, you know, because we need to wait and see what's going to happen. I will say the dangers of that is the more, the longer you wait, if you don't have a strategy going forward with accepting here are what the changes are going to be and figure out how you're going to address those within your organization, are you going to actually change your productivity work RVU threshold? Are you going to change your comp per work RVU rate um, in your employment agreements? Are you going to go to a completely different model? Are you going to do now focus on how do I incorporate more of my compensation into, you know, into value, into quality, into those different endeavors? then frame you know i i wouldn't recommend kicking the can down the road any further without actively working on what are you going to do about it because right now we are having especially a lot of primary care physicians saying their whole purpose behind these work review changes was to appropriately point out the value of primary care and how critical it is that you know your primary care alignment is in place and so you need to be paying attention to that for, I would say that that should be at the top of your list as far as which compensation to address and how can you get it into a line with what's going on with CMS and the physician fee schedule and what's going on, frankly, we, we just got the final rule for MIPS. We'll do a web, another webinar about what's going on with the new final rule with MIPS later on um, is around how you're going to change your primary care. So you need to think about it in not just, I like thinking about compensation strategy, not from what's going to work for today and here and now, but let's thinking about it from a longer term perspective. What is our total remuneration package and how does that fit into a provider recruitment and development plan and our overall alignment? So that way we can, we can make this work for us as far as 
okay, what agreements do we have in place? What is our current compensation strategy? How can it change with us as CMS makes these changes and doubles down on the focus on primary care? Does that align with our strategy? If not, should it be part of our strategy? If employment is not part of our strategy, how are we gonna work with the independent physicians? Maybe part of the value add is if we're not gonna change compensation, it's greater alignment around stuff like surprise billing and pricing transparency. We're gonna have, we're gonna take some of that load off of your plate, which allows you to focus on the nature of being a physician and it, because we, we're not gonna change the compensation. And compensation is what we can afford financially, but we'll take this off of your plate. These are really important with thinking about how can I engage with my providers now and about whether it's not just about compensation and really evaluating what your alignment is. Alignment is not just do I employ the physician or not, because I think we all understand that it's not a matter of tell somebody to jump and, they'll, and if you employ them, they have to jump as high as you say that, to jump. That's not how it works. And, um, you know, that's not a measure of good alignment. It's where where is there the appropriate give and take that drives overall strategy forward. So that being said, wait, if you're going to the next slide, let's talk about telehealth, because I think that this is an important strategy thing that actually has received, that I've seen meet some resistance, right? We, where there's an agreement that telehealth creates opportunities and where you know it's used appropriately, but I, it's amazing to me that with COVID, some groups very much resonated with telehealth is great. I, I will say patients are the ones who said telehealth is great if it keeps me from having to make a trip, you know, um, all the way out to a doctor's office that might not be convenient for me, or if it's increased my access to specific specialties that are normally not available in my area. You know, they think about telehealth being really important from that standpoint. But I just have to say, a lot of people, primarily providers, who were so excited when people could come back into the patient office and said, I would rather not do telehealth visits. I, I don't want to, you know, I didn't like it. It was, a, I couldn't provide it to go to quality care. But the reality is, is we do have provider sh um, shortages, even with specialties that we do have available in person. And so we need to think about what are the technology resources, like, you know, how do we make this part of a long-term strategy to alleviate these shortages and to give people access and what are, you know, what are those partnerships that are going to be available? And, and how does, you know, I, I have to question, I actually, I, I feel bad I didn't discuss this with Amy and Wade beforehand, but how does surprise billing going to, you know, telehealth impact with surprise billing is, is that an additional provider that might be out of network? And what kind of agreements do you need to have with your telehealth providers to make sure that you're dealing with any surprise billing issues on, on that end um, and what does that contracting look like so i will say i think it's here to stay i think cms has also has shown that to us and it, we now we have to embrace that as part of our strategy and think about where it fits in and and how can we make it work for our providers so that they don't feel okay thank goodness i'm past that and patients can come back to me in person um, and how can we can counter that and give them what they need whether it's whether it's education, whether it's technology resources, um, additional help, um, broadband access, and you know, those different pieces to make sure that we're creating a telehealth strategy. So I see that we are all, that we are just about out of time. So with that, Amy, do you want to just touch on a couple of pieces about out of network impact on the patient? Um, yes, I can do that. And so related to out of network impact, the one thing I want to point out, uh, we will have the slide deck available for you if you'd like to see it. Um, but also the to realize that when new providers are added to your hospital staff, um, they can be considered out of network until payer credentialing is complete. So that's the one area that I would say that I would um, just want to bring to everyone's attention and that patient satisfaction is going to decrease if um, patients receive out of network bills and um, from providers associated with the facility. And with the patient, there is going to be an impact there as well. Um, and it's, you know, there are improved patient protections. 
And so they, uh, for most emergency services and post stabilization services, non-emergency services from out of networks. So there is going to be a positive patient impact by not getting these um, unexpected bills coming through. And want to follow up too with just a call to action. Where do we want to um, end this call and just summarize the things it should do and that hospitals and facilities that you, you need to publish a list of what your in-network payers are and then for the providers you know review that list with the pay, with the hospitals what are those in-network payers and are you in network with them as well um, have a list of associated providers and ancillary services provided by the hospitals and then share this with your patients not only at pre-registration but at registration at discharge and then for a provider you know can you identify those out of network situations and what can you do to um, prevent them from happening if possible to become in network and then leverage some of the um, information that's been shared on this call today um, opportunities with telehealth and other services that are out there and so because we are at the end of our time we do have uh, we've provided our contact information so there's opal's information wade's information and my my own feel free to send us an email or give us a call uh, to discuss any of the items that you may have um, heard about on the call today. If you want to discuss them further, we'd be more than happy to have a conversation with you. I do want to thank everyone for your time today. We recognize that in these challenging times, your time is very valuable, and we appreciate that you chose to spend the time with us today. So thank you very much, everyone, and um, I will head it back over to our moderator to close out the call. And thank you very much, and we'll shut it down now.